church, I tell you what, I, you know, these songs that we're singing this morning, I just praise God. God, God is the God of a breakthrough, right? He, he's the light. Are, 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 are you sitting in confusion? Are you sitting in darkness? You know, all we have to do is invite the light in. Jesus, I need you. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Come, Lord. Come. Jesus, what a name. What a, what a powerful name. You know, my brother and I here and soon others, we, we go to IY State's Illinois Youth Correction Facility. There's a generation there that does not know even the stories of the Bible. This, this, this last week, you know, I, I prayed individually with five, five young men, okay? And I had a Bible study with just one, okay? It was just one, but, you know, to plant that seed, you know, what an honor. And, and, and so my question to him, have you heard of the story of Jesus crucified at the cross? And I, I told him to understand what happened at the cross. We, we need to know that, that Jesus is God. And, and, and it is Jesus wrapped in flesh that, that came to this world to save us. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there was a light that shines in the dark. That, that light was Jesus, a true light to everyone in the world. He was in the world, but they didn't know him. It's kind of like today. That, that God, Jesus, came out of that grave. But they, they don't know him. This is why we're so important right now for him, for God's work. We've got to tell people that that grave is empty. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, it, it's, it's so powerful, you know, in the scripture because he made the world. But that word wrapped himself in flesh and he walked among us. And I asked that young man, what was Jesus' crime? And we went through Matthew 26, 27, 28, and we, we talked about what happened. And, and the, it was so fascinating, the, not fasting, but it was just awesome, his response. He, he told me, he told me that I, I'm very angry at God. I, I'm very angry. There's a lot of hurt people. And these are, these are young men, like 16 to 18, that, you know, they already got the wounds, right? And they're confused and they're angry. This and I said, you know, we, we we've got to, you know, you you recognize now that, was was did Jesus did he have any crimes? Said no, he didn't. So so I'm telling you that you you can give that hurt, you can give that problem to him right now, and and earlier that day, my 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 faith was just raised every time I prayed with someone because I felt the presence of God. I had two young men, angry right feeling betrayed i had one young man that said okay listen we're gonna pray right and i laid my hands on him i said okay i want you to take whatever that thing is whatever that thing is from the past i want you to wrap it up right and, and i want you to give it to god right now i want to put it on the altar and, and without my prompting okay and i'm not saying this this is not in the bible but he he, he lifted his hands like this like he was carrying that weight and he went like this and raised his hand and that laid hands on him. He says, keep up releasing it. And then in that Bible study, same thing. That young man that was actually trying to pursue Satanism, right? Because Satanism is like rebellion. That's what it is. And he was in rebellion, but he was hurt. He was angry. But he said, okay, okay, I'll try it. I'll give it to him. And he did the same thing. I'm telling you, God can do anything for anyone. If you're in darkness, I'm telling you, there's a light. We just got to invite them in. We got to invite them in. So, you know, I, I, I continue, I want to continue to see the good things of God. And, you know, at the end of the, every message there, you know, I want to tell them how, how, how to go to heaven. Okay, what does the book say? And, you know, I, I tell them you got to believe in God, right? You got to know that this word is true. And when you hear that word, you all have a testimony. We need to tell our testimony. And remember what 
Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the message. This is probably the only thing I can tell anyone, right? Uh, there, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can listen. If you hear it and believe, do it. If you do it, you'll be blessed. In Jesus' name, thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you, Brother Wara, for your word. Thank you for your passion for the lost. Hallelujah. A little bit of housekeeping here. I'm so thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And there's more to that statement than what may meet the eye, but I am so thankful to be here, to enjoy the presence of our Savior, who had such great compassion on me. I used to apologize for things like this, but I don't apologize for the presence of the Lord. Oh, the Lord is good. I have spent the last four days in unintended, unplanned rest, which I don't know that God orchestrated, but God definitely used to be able to speak to me I'm thankful for that. Before we get into the word of the Lord, I, I do want to make mention of, a, of something here. Some of you were, many of you, not everybody here, but were in the leadership meeting on Monday. We heard Pastor Bai speak to us. And I would ask the church, those who are not regular members of Bartlett UPC, you can just sort of close your ears for a moment. <laughs> That's not you. <laughs> I'm going to read some verses that you are very familiar with. And I'm going to ask that you not tune me out. That just because you've heard the words before, the scriptures before, I'm going to ask that you not dismiss them as, yeah, I've heard that before. And I'm going to tell you why. The first reason is that there are people in this building and who are watching online that they haven't heard this before. They haven't experienced what I'm going to share with you. And if we as the body check out in the spirit, we leave them spiritually stranded to try to navigate from where they're at to where God wants them to bring be. And we can't do that, church. Secondly, there's three parts to the, to the scripture passage that we're going to use. And if you zone out on the first part, you're going to miss the second part. And if you miss the second part, you'll have no concept or understanding of the third part. So I'm asking that you stay engaged today. Hallelujah. I also want to give honor and recognition to Pastor Betcher, who is not with us right now. Uh, he's with us, but not with us. Yet. It's not like, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> that came out weird. He's not with us. <laughs> no, he's still alive. He's doing well. <laughs> I've been praying diligently that he would have a great, abundant, successful harvest. <laughs> He's fishing in Alaska for salmon. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Sister Betcher, wherever she is, there she is. My honor to you, to our pastor staff, 
our couples, Lord. Oh, Lord. I want each of you to know how much I love and appreciate you and how thankful I am that you have been a part of my life. I honor you today. I told my wife I was going to have to pace myself, and I said, yeah, famous last words, but I don't want to rush here. I want to make sure that I don't want to be boring, but I also don't want to just zoom past things, and then we miss the impact of the Scripture and the impact of what the Spirit wants to say to us today. Hallelujah. In honor of the reading of the Word, which Pastor By is a biblical tradition, would you stand with me? And we're not going to read all of the scriptures that I have here while you're standing, but we will read a representative of the scriptures, and then you'll be able to be seated. As a matter of fact, this scripture is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. It is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer, although theologically, really, the Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. Jesus gave this as an example of prayer. Now, I want to ask you, how many have ever heard this passage of Scripture? (laughs) Okay. I'm sure many of you can quote it. Now, here in our church, the Pentecostal way, we don't come to service every time and recite the Lord's Prayer. But I'm going to ask you to read it aloud with me not as part of a liturgical process, but as part of honor of the Word of God. Is that okay? So Matthew 6, 9 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if only Jesus had stopped speaking there. Hmm. If only. But he didn't. And the 14th and 15th verses, he said, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That went from a nice prayer to like, oh me. And with that, you may be seated. And Joseph, if you would come. Joseph... And Pastor By are going to help me out today. Can anybody see what this is? It's a paper clip. It's a big one, isn't it? It's not one of those little, it's a big paper clip. I want you all to understand and know that this is Joseph's debt. Can you say that? Joseph's debt. It's a big debt, isn't it? Thank you. Here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus has established a principle. Some would call this maybe even quid pro quo. But the fact of the matter is that there is a connection between our behavior, our thoughts, our actions that we demonstrate toward others and the thoughts, actions that God demonstrates towards us. All right. In Matthew chapter 18, this whole chapter is an amazing chapter. And and we sometimes pull scriptures out of these chapters. And and I'm not saying that's erroneous. I'm not saying that's wrong or bad. But in doing so, we sometimes miss the really impact and the purpose and the context of the scripture. 
Matthew 18 starts out by the disciples coming and saying, who is the greatest amongst uh, the kingdom? Wow. I think there's a pride issue going on there. It, can you imagine walking up to Jesus? You know, am I the greatest? Jesus calls as... If you've ever read this chapter, he calls a little child over and he says, unless you become as one of these. Then he goes through this whole process of conversation with them that seems to have nothing to do. He talks about the children, then he talks about offenses, and he talks about people. If you offend one of these little ones, it would be better that a millstone be hang, put around your neck and you'd be cast in the sea. And then he starts talking about, and if your brother have offense, you've offended your brother, you go, and, and if your brother's offended, you go to him and you, and you make it right. And if he doesn't hear you, you go get another brother and you go to him. And if he doesn't hear you, then you take it before the church. Then he talks, starts talking about Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. See, that's a scripture we really like, but we have to understand the context of that. While that principle is true in many areas, the context of the scripture was all going back to who's the greatest in the kingdom. And dealing with sin and forgiveness. And then he says, another favorite verse, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But we, oh, we love that verse. Don't we? I do. I've quoted it a thousand times. Out of the nearly 10,000 times I've been in church since I was born, Pastor By, we've quoted that so many times. But, and yes, it works. Yes, it's true. If you're in your house and you got two or three believers together, God's with you. If two or three are gathered together in your house, then God is with you. Amen. We're getting there. If two or three are gathered together in your house, then God is with you. Amen. Ha! All right. <laughs> but we have to understand that this is all in the context of what it means and how do we become great in the kingdom of God is that we become like a child. There's a verse that Jesus says in the early part of 18 where he talks about forgiving. And I don't know how long it was between that verse and verse 21. I don't know if it was immediate. I don't know if it was a day. I don't know if it was a week. I don't know if it was a month. But apparently that verse sort of stuck in Peter's mind. And he'd been sort of chewing on that. Have you ever read something in the scripture and you went, oh, hmm, uh, Wow. What? Really? And that's, that's a, the, the reaction I sort of get from Peter because in verse 21 in the King James Version it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? He is referencing back to what Jesus had said earlier in this 18th chapter. Now, in the Amplified Version, it says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go? Up to seven times? So Peter was even sort of hedging on that. Is it four? Is it five? Six? Not seven. <laughs> the part that struck me in the Amplified Version, why I read it, is the let it go part. See, oh. Should I go there? Yeah. All right. See, you told me to go there. <laughs> See, I, I could have something between Pastor Williams and I. We don't, as far as I know. All right. I love this brother. And all of a sudden something happens and he says something to me that your shoes look stupid. I don't, whatever it is. Your socks are boring. <laughs> they are. Well, today they're sort of fancy. And I could get something in my spirit about that. And then God convicts me and I say, Brother Williams, I forgive you. 
And I'll walk away and say, but I'm never going to wear socks like you want me to wear. <laughs> Have I let it go? No. Two weeks later, I see him and I sort of, I look at his socks. He's got pretty fancy socks on. <laughs> <laughs> And I see those socks, and I went, eh, those socks. Have I let it go? A month goes by. This is a, this is a petty little thing, right? It probably wouldn't happen that way. You sure? Oftentimes... What's the Aesop's fable? It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's those little annoyances, those little grievances, those little things that we never really deal with that sort of dig into us after a while and we won't let it go. So Jesus says unto him in Matthew 18, 22 through 27, and again, church, you've heard this verse so many times. I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And then he begins a story, a parable, a discussion, an illustration. I want you to remember the question that Peter asked. What did Peter ask? He asked, how many times if my brother sins against me, do I forgive him? Isn't it amazing how many times Jesus is approached with a question and his answer doesn't seem to have anything to do with the question? And if we only read the first part of this, which we're going to read and we're going to talk about because we have a paper clip to talk about. But we, I want you to remember, the question that Peter asked was not, Lord, how many times can I sin against you and you forgive me? His question was not, Lord, if I've sinned against you once, is it okay? I mean, can I get forgiveness if it's a hundred times? His question was not about his relationship with his, serv with his master. His question was not about his relationship with the Messiah, with Jesus, the Savior, God, the King. His question was relating to his brother. And Jesus launches into this and says, it's the kingdom of heaven is like a king. I want you to notice, as a matter of fact, would you say the word king? King. See, the relationship here is a king to a servant. It's not to a brother to a brother. It's not a peer to a peer. This isn't Devon and Jeremy haggling over a hundred bucks that one of them owes the other. This isn't about... Somebody saying, well, you loaned me money for gas and you haven't paid it back. No, this is a servant to a king. There's a different relationship here. And he says the king called for an accounting. And in the process of the accounting, he quickly comes across a man who owes him 10,000 talents. And we've heard, I've heard so many times the explanation of what a talent is and how much it is. I've heard it a lot. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling. And yet I came across something in my study that helped me understand. And really the point of the whole thing is not how big that was. The whole point of it was the discrepancy, disparity between what was owed to the king and what the servant owed to the servant. But I want you to understand this. So if you could flip that slide up, I'd appreciate it. One talent is equal to 6,000 denarii. Now you know what a talent is. Fortunately, line two, one denarius was equal to a one day's wage. Are you feeling the impact of that already? One day's wage is equal to one denarius and six thousand denarius denarii equal one talent and this dude owed ten thousand so one talent was equivalent depending on how you calculate a man's uh work life in jewish times 
So it could be 16 years, it could be 19 years, it could be 15 years. I don't think it really makes much difference at that point. One talent is equal to 16 years of labor. I've been in the workforce since I was 14. That's 50 years. So 10,000 talents equals out to 150 or 160,000 years of labor. Do you, do, you, do you understand the, the significance of what this guy owed? I want you to understand something here today. That the story wasn't about talents and money and how much he owed. It wasn't really that. Jesus didn't even thinly disguise what he's really talking about. Yes, he's talking about forgiveness. He's talking about principles of, principles of forgiveness. But he was trying to explain to us is we have a debt that is upon our lives, that each one of us has incurred to the King of kings, the sovereign God, the Lord of lords, the King of all glory. It's a debt that comes because of sin, and it weighs so heavily upon us because there's no way we could ever pay it back. I, I, I tried to think. I, I sat and considered and thought, how does somebody rack up 10,000 talents of debt? How, how, do, how do you get there? We sang the song on Monday, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon the cross. I've always thought of that from the standpoint of it's hard for us as humans to comprehend the value of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is true. But in my prayer and consideration of this passage of Scripture, it came to me, I really don't understand the debt of sin that I personally owed. I don't know that I can fully comprehend what my disobedience, contrariness, pride and arrogance before the Lord disobedience to his word. I really can't fully comprehend the mountain of debt that I incurred. And you start, start with simple things. Nobody starts out on the extreme aspect of sin. It's been said so many times, but I'm going to say it again because it, it works so well, it fits. It, and I'm not saying you should do this. It's cruel to eat animals, but apparently somebody did because they have the story. If you take a frog and you put it in hot water, it will leap out. But if you take the same frog and you put it in a pot of water that's not hot, and then you turn the heat on, it will never hop out because his body will begin to acclimate to, to the temperature of the water until it comes to a point where it can't acclimate anymore. And that's exactly what sin does. See, sin comes and it destroys our will. It destroys our ability to even see sometimes right and wrong, to differentiate between what I should do and what I shouldn't do. And after a period of time, the sin begins to be a weight on us. And even though we owe the debt to the king, the burden of the weight is upon us. And it's things after things. It's, it's a wrong spirit. It's a wrong attitude. It's, yes, sometimes it's the big stuff, and I'm going to get there in a second. But a lot of times it's not the big, hairy, bad sins that we all talk about. It's the little stuff. 
It's the little grievances between a friend, between friends, the grievance between brother and sister, the grievance between a parent and a child, or between siblings. It's a grievance between neighbors. It's some kind of attitude or spirit. It's a little lie here and a little lie there. It's a little twisting of the truth here and a bending of the rules here. It's a little bit, just a little bit of materialism. It's just a little bit of greed. It's just a little bit of jealousy. It's just, it's not really big. It's not really bad. It's been said so many times, but it's true. Nobody becomes a drug addict because they wanted to. Nobody becomes an alcoholic. Nobody got up one day and said, I am going to drink myself into alcoholism. But it's a drink here, it's a shot here, it's a glass here, it's a stop after work here, it's a little bit here, and all of a sudden years go by, they've lost their house, they've lost their family, they've lost their job, they're living on the streets, homeless. How did that happen? Because just a little bit at a time. A little bit here, a little bit there. Nobody starts out one day sitting down at a computer and flipping open a website and looking at something they shouldn't look at and say, oh yeah, I'm going to become addicted to this so it destroys my life. Nobody gets up one morning and says, hey, today I think I'll go find a way to just ruin my life. But that's what sin does. It's insidious. It, it creeps on us and creeps on us and creeps on us. And the weight becomes heavier, and the burden becomes heavier, and we don't even really understand what's going on, and all of a sudden we've got this weight on us. What we don't understand and what we need to realize, it's just like there was an coming and accounting of the king to his servants. There's coming a day when every one of us will stand before the king of kings and give account as well. Pastor By, if you would stand. He is going to represent the king. I obviously am the servant. So the king called for the servant, brought him before him. The Bible says the servant fell at his feet. Sorry, that was a slow fall, but <laughs> fell at his feet because the king had said, Take his wife, take his children take him and sell them. Take everything he has, sell it, every possession, every precious thing that he'd accumulated in life, sell it and pay off the debt. I want you to understand that your debt doesn't just impact you. Oh, Jesus. Somebody needs to know that today. You're contemplating something right now in the spirit. You need to, oh, shut up. You need to understand that what's in your mind right now is not of God. It's of the enemy. He's trying to destroy you, but if you follow it, he's going to destroy those that are close to you. Can we pray right now in the name of Jesus? So he throws himself at the feet of the king. This guy had no clue, folks. He was just told the old 10,000 talents. Throws himself at the feet of the king and says, Oh, please have patience with me. If you just give me enough time, I'll pay it all back. Huh. Are you kidding? The Bible says that the king was moved with compassion. Oh, and I want to jump ahead. I'll just hold that. And the king forgave him of all that debt.
those of you who have experienced repentance and baptism, do you remember the day that you were baptized? That's right, Brother Randy, you can clap. For those of you who may be here or online, looking at the wrong camera there, if you've never come to this point of kneeling before the King of Kings and ask for his mercy, in about 10, 20 minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity. We talk, call this thing opening the altar. It's just this front area or maybe at your pew. I'm going to invite you to come and kneel before the King of Kings and ask for his mercy. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our iniquity. He will take that tet of sin from you. Eight years old when I was baptized, and I remember it like it was yesterday. Oh, I had a large, vast accumulation of sins. I'd murdered 500 people. <laughs> but I remember coming up out of the water and feeling so different, so clean, so pure, so innocent. <laughs> when this man was forgiven, and I wish I had the physical strength to do what I really want to do. This man was forgiven. He should have come up off his knees. He should have been dancing. He should have been shouting. He should have been running the aisles. He should have been walking through the city, declaring how great his king was, how merciful he was, how gracious he was. He should have been exuberant. He should have been running to his wife and his kids and saying, come family, gather together. Let me tell you what just happened. We all, you were on your way to the slave block, but the king forgave me. He took the date away. And every one of us are free. Free, free, free. And I wish that's what had happened. Now, I read this next portion of Scripture from Matthew 18, 27 through 30. I read it in probably 10, 12 different translations. Because the King James Version said something to me that I'd never really Cogniz been cognizant before. And I wanted to see, is it really saying what it's saying, Pastor Williams? Because I've always taken this, that the guy was in front of the king, he comes out of the palace, and he sees Joseph. But the King James doesn't say that. And so about half the translations sort of follow with King James, and about the half the translations sort of give that understanding. But this guy had such a horrible attitude that I'm tending to believe that what he did is he walked out of the presence of the king having been delivered of all of this. And he went and he went seeking. He went looking and he found Joseph. And he grabbed him. Haul him up here. And the Bible says he began to choke him. I promised him I wouldn't do that. The Greek word there means throttled. This was violent. There wasn't, there wasn't even a hint of compassion. Stay right there. There was nothing in that man toward this fellow servant. This is what he got rid of. This is what he was owed. Oh, you don't know it anymore. I forgave you. How could somebody who had been forgiven of so much demand repayment of so little? 
You're not going to like me, no. Help my spirit, Lord. There's, there's an end time harvest coming. We know that. We believe that. And we ought to be here believe that. I believe there's a massive incoming into the kingdom of God. I believe he is calling people from the north and the south and the east and the west. I believe that the harvest of the end time is greater than this building and a hundred buildings like it can contain. I believe that the harvest is coming so great that it will boggle our minds. But I also firmly believe and convinced that part of the harvest is the call to the backslider. Those who are wayward, those who have gone away, who have left the church, who got angry, bitter, hurt, uh, disappointed, disillusioned, something. And God is going to call them back. He, God, has personally shown me people that are away from God right now that are going to be back. And, oh, my God, if they come back and we have the spirit of the older son instead of the spirit of the prodigal. (laughs) It's been years. It's been years since a young man by the name of Tim and I interacted Tim grew up in the church. Good young man. Good kid. I was his youth pastor. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> Something happened. Tim met a young lady who turned his attention from God. He left the church. Some time went by and had the opportunity to run into him, started talking with him, praying with him. And he said, I'm, I would love to come back, but I'm afraid to. I'm afraid what everybody will say. I convinced him to come back, Pastor By, Pastor Smith. I said, don't worry, I'll be there for you. He came back. Oh, church. You that have been around a while know what I'm about to say. There's people in that building, that church, they were just like this servant. And he left and has never been back since. If Jesus Christ died shed his blood, gave everything that he has for me. Who am I to withhold one ounce of forgiveness? How could it be? I'm going to try to explain this, that there's a difference between being a debtor and having a spirit of a debtor. See, when this man came to the king, he was a debtor and had a spirit of the debtor. But when he was forgiven, he was no longer a debtor. Did you get that? Was he forgiven? Yes or no? Amen? Praise God, something? All across the congregation, in the far back recesses to the, to the massive, you know, balcony. Speaking of balcony, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt this. Look at this screen. New screen, new projector, Brother Gentleman. Thank you, sir. I am certainly thankful for Brother and Sister Gentleman. Prayer works. (laughs) 
We've been praying for them to make the missionary journey from Wisconsin to Illinois for quite some time. Love you, folks. He was forgiven. The debt was erased. But his spirit wasn't changed. And the only way that I can see him behaving the way he behaved is that if in his spirit, in his mind, Pastor Williams, he thought, I better go out and collect all the things that are owed to me and just in case the king changes his mind. What that was saying is, I have absolutely no faith or trust in what the king did. And can I tell you, when you won't forgive your brother, your sister, your friend, your family member, your neighbor, you are acting toward God the exact same way that man acted toward his king. You really don't have faith and trust in your Redeemer who has freely and totally forgiven you. You're afraid that if you forgive somebody else, you won't get what's due you. Well, guess what? You're not going to get what's due you if you go to the foot of the master. Because what's due us. There's an old hymn, and if you look it up, if you don't like southern bluegrass sort of gospel, you're not going to like the song, but the words are really good. The words say, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. This last three or four days, I have specifically prayed that the spirit of the debtor would be relieved, removed, eliminated, and we would be de delivered from it. It's insidious. It sneaks in in places that we don't understand and recognize. It's that little offense that comes and you sort of go, ugh, ah. Then it sort of festers there like a paper cut that gets something in it. And all of a sudden you look at it and it's all oozy and icky. You know how you fix that? You slice it open. Get all the infection out and put some healing ointment. And what sometimes God has to do to us is he's got to slice us open. It's uncomfortable. It hurts. It's painful. But then he can heal, pour in the healing balm of his anointing oil. And then he can pour that into our spirits. And then in that place, we then become free to be as forgiving as we are forgiven. The first part of this passage of Scripture brings us great joy. And I wish that Jesus had just stopped when the man got forgiven. I really do. We'd have a made-for-Hallmark TV movie. Right? It's a beautiful story. It is. I'm not, I'm not making mockery. I'm not, I'm not jesting here. It's a phenomenal story. And it's a story that has been lived and experienced over and over and over and over again. There are some of you in this building today, you haven't knelt at the foot of the master. You haven't been freed from the sin and the weight and the debt. Some of you might be thinking, but I don't know how to get there. I'm too bad. I've done too much. I'm not, I could never qualify for that. Can I tell you that sitting amongst you right now, are people that are former convicts, drug addicts, alcoholics. There are people among us that were nasty, nasty people. Some of them have publicly given their testimony. And so I'm not going to call them out. You know who they are. Gung dealers, loan sharks. I will say this. Our pastor was a drug dealer and a cocaine addict. 
And worst of all, a member of a Southern rock band. <laughs> that, I shouldn't have said that. Lord, forgive me. Will you forgive me for saying that? That, that was not the worst of it. <laughs> but it wasn't funny. <laughs> if you knew my whole story, huh, oh, how merciful my God has been to me. Huh. can't in any way, shape, form, or fashion, not that Pastor Smet has done or will do or there's anything there, I could never withhold forgiveness from you. I when I look at Calvary and I see me, not at the foot of the cross, but on the cross, because that's where I belonged. But my Redeemer took it upon me. In Matthew chapter 6, when we read the Lord's, what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, Jesus didn't finish, as I said, with the prayer. He said, for if you forgive others, then your heavenly Father, remember this, will forgive you. And if you forgive not, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you. We don't like that verse, and so we don't use it. it it's hard for me to comprehend that verse. That means if, if he offended me and I refuse to forgive, that God cuts off all forgiveness to me, Yep. Yep. Can you say amen or owe me? That's what it means, Doc. I didn't write the book. I didn't speak the words. Jesus did. Now, Brother Shane and I, we're pretty good friends, and we're brothers in the Lord. I love hanging out with this guy. He never will, but I love hanging out with him. <laughs> now I've offended him, and now I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness. <laughs> If he did something and I chose not to forgive him, God shuts off the flow of forgiveness to me. And Lord have mercy, I can't afford that. But when I was studying this scripture, the next section of this scripture blew me away. So in verses 31 through 35... What occurred between the two servants? Servant one, throttling servant two, all over a paper clip. They looked at it. This guy, who'd been forgiven all of this, took that guy and threw him into prison until he could pay back the debt. Now, first of all, folks, that's just plain That's not a word that you use in the pulpit. So I... It's just ignorant. How is he going to pay his debt when he's in prison? In early European times, there was something called a debtor's prison. That if you had owed a debt, you couldn't pay, you got thrown into prison. Well, dude, I don't want the guy in prison. I want him out working five jobs. <laughs> right? Pay it back, man. I don't care if it's 100 bucks or 10,000 bucks. You're not ever going to pay me back one thing sitting in prison. <laughs> so that's sort of dumb. But other than that, what should have happened is when he went from this to freedom, he should have been running around trying to find every person that owed him money and saying, I forgive. 
forgive you of whatever you owe me. I forgive you of whatever you owe me. I forgive you whatever you owe me. I forgive you of whatever you owe me. He should have found every person that had ever done anything, said anything, acted in any way, found them all. He'd just been forgiven of 10,000 talents. He'd have to search for thousands and thousands of people to come even close to equaling what he'd been forgiven of. That's not what he did. And the fellow servants went to the king and reported what had happened. All I can say is you better hope and pray that your brothers and sisters never feel the need to go to God in prayer because of your offensive behavior. The Bible says that the Lord was wroth. That's like anger on steroids. He called for that servant. He said, what in the world are you doing? You should have had the same compassion on your fellow servant as I had on you. But because you chose not to forgive, I'm taking all of that debt that I forgave you of, and I'm putting it back on you, and I'm throwing you into outer darkness where you will spend eternity. Quiet here, as it ought to be. Do you understand the implications of that? See, I was raised in this. I have heard the scriptures for my whole life that our sins are cast in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so are your sins cast from me. But apparently not if you are an unforgiving servant. Stand with me. I know this is a heavy word. I I understand that. But I'm going to come back to a statement I made as to why this is so important. Through those doors, those glass doors, In my spirit, I see people walking through those doors right now that need forgiveness. They've offended or been offended. And God is God is calling to them right now. He's wooing them. They have his spirit, it's just his spirit doesn't have them, if I can put it that term. But he's reaching for them. He's pulling for them. He's longing for them. Some of you parents that have kids away, hear this. They're coming back. Some of you kids that have parents that are away, they're coming back. Some of you that have sisters and brothers, and I'm not talking church sisters. I'm talking about family that's away from God. I prayed for a nephew for I don't know how many years, prayed and sought God. He's got tattoos all over his whole body. He doesn't look like an apostolic preacher, but let me tell you something. Today, he is. What you look like doesn't determine what you are. When the blood of Jesus Christ comes and cleanses and purifies and makes whole, he changes everything about you. But sometimes he takes the exterior stuff and leaves it there so that you can be a testimony, living, breathing of the mercies of God. (laughs) 
What if somebody had turned to my nephew when he came through the doors and says, who do you think you are coming back here looking like that? Oh, oh Jesus. Those of you that are in this building today or watching online, if you've never come to the foot of Calvary today, today, maybe you've come before, but it just didn't seem that, at least in your view, that forgiveness was there. Maybe you've come to the foot of Calvary multiple times, but you walk away and fall back into old habits and patterns. Whatever it may be, I said we were going to open the altar and invite you to have the opportunity to kneel before your master. Simply Father, forgive me. Maybe you're here today. I, I wish I could say when I was praying and studying and reading these passages of Scripture, and I came to this part about the servant forgiven of so much, but unwilling to forgive. I don't say this in any way other than to let you know I'm just like you. I just happen to have a microphone in my hand and perhaps a different calling. I lay on the couch weeping in the presence of the Lord thanking him for his infinite mercy, the depths of his love, the heights of his graciousness. And then I had to pray, Father, is there anybody that I've offended? I want to make it right with them. And then I prayed, is there anybody that offended me that I haven't forgiven? And immediately, two people came to my mind. Oh. Everything in my, my human nature and flesh crawls at the thought of going to them and saying, Pastor Bai is not one of them, and saying, I forgive you. But if I don't, now that he's brought it to my attention, the windows of heaven are closed to me. So I started writing a letter. One of the people I have no opportunity to go see. So I started writing a letter. And the presence of the Lord just from the act of writing the letter. I haven't even sent it yet. But you know what that means? Yes, I'm going to send it. I need to send it because he needs to know. But you know what that tells me? That Jesus Christ has already released me from that. So maybe you're in the congregation today or you're in the congregation online and there's somebody that you've been holding out forgiveness. Can I tell you that forgiveness is the most liberating thing you will ever experience? Both the recipient and the giver. Jesus, 
I thank you for the strength that I have felt today. I thank you for your convicting word, but yet your reassuring word that your love is immeasurable, that your mercy knows no bounds, that you are faithful and just, willing to freely forgive us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be like you. Freely we have received, freely also we can give. I pray for the body of people that have gathered here and online. I pray that this word would come to them, bring them guidance, wisdom, and understanding. I pray for those who have never experienced the liberation of forgiveness from you, that here as we close the preaching part and open this time of prayer, that they would come and find that freedom, that forgiveness. So as Brother Chris comes, I invite anyone else to come as well.